and we have a dress code here. We're like, <laughs> you know, kind of casual hanging out here. Occasionally people break said dress code, but in a good way. And one of those men is Riley Nelson, who now joins us. Look at, look at this. Look at this. I mean, this. are you going to Miami? You look fantastic. Well, you know, out in the lobby, they had after further review on. Yeah. And, you know, with Dave and Dave and Blaine out there, they can't be the only ones, you know, yeah, with the open yeah, collar sport coat that's, look. That's another level, so. right? Yeah. <laughs> if they, we had known, we probably would have also put on a sport coat and, yeah. a, and a shirt with a collar. Maybe we do yeah. it. Maybe like a formal to, today's a Tuesday. Maybe we make this today's a tradition. Wednesday, right? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Today is, to, is, today yeah. is Wednesday. Well, we can do whatever day you want. You tell us. Tuesday, we'll Wednesday? We'll okay. Yeah, we'll no, next it. time. We'll okay. do it. We're done. Right. It's done. Awesome. We've already decided it. Okay, let's talk about, first off, we'll get to this season and the games, but uh, the Utah series is extended through 2028, four more years, yet there's a two-year hiatus in 2022 and 23. You a fan of the hiatus? Are you okay with it? How do you feel? Yeah, I'm not a fan of it, but I understand. Like, Utah was able to negotiate a home-and-home -home with Florida, and it being an independent, we, you know, we're trying to fill up as many quality opponents. With them being a conference and their non-conference game limited, it's just... It's just a matter of fact. And so I, I'm okay. I wouldn't like it to be any more than two years. And so I, I'm 100% okay. And while I would prefer it to be every year, I understand why it can't be. BYU through four games, two and two, coming off a loss to Washington. BYU heads into week five. What's your evaluation of this team so far? I would say, based off the vast majority of preseason talk uh, and sentiment, that they've exceeded expectations. Now, for mine, I sat on this very show, and I thought they were going to go two and two through the first four. Uh, people thought I was a little bit – I was wearing some blue glasses, some blue goggles. We have some if you'd like some here. <laughs> <laughs> firmly, it doesn't go with the sport code <laughs> next time. They're firmly attached. Already. Yeah, no, but uh, but I think by most people's expectations, they, or they've exceeded most people's expectations, and, and I think we've learned a lot about this team. I I think we've learned that they're a consummate team, one that uh, competes in all three phases, and you're never quite sure who the star of the day will be, whether it's going to be on offense, defense, or special teams. Uh, so I really like that. That was something I didn't know coming in, that they're the consummate team. But I also think they have some questions to answer. I think that uh, we need more offensive production, especially uh, in the consistency of the passing game. We need to sure up some run defense, and we have to decide what we're going to be a, a three-man front or a four-man front, or are we going to be one that can adapt based on the uh, offense that we're facing that week? And uh, so I think there's some questions to be remained. And the good thing is I think there's a great opportunity to answer those questions and solidify them in this next month of the season. Let's talk about that because there's this assumption, oh, no Power Fives anymore, it's going to be easy. I think it's going to be easier, but I don't think it's going to be easy. And you said something on the radio broadcast, which I watch and I listen, by the way. You do Thank a you. really good job. Thank you. You said that, listen, there's, there are several guys, right, on these Power Five teams that BYU's played. Everyone can match up with the BYU receivers. There'll be a couple of guys that can match up with BYU's receivers. So do you anticipate BYU getting more open in the past game now? I do. I expect a step... Uh, I expect the BYU pass game to take the biggest step forward. We didn't get a ton of looks of this BYU offense versus zone defense, but we actually did against Washington when Matt Bushman was catching all those over routes uh, for 20 yards. He had like three or four of them this past game. That was when Washington kind of relented. They weren't where USC, Tennessee, and Utah, they were man 90% of the time. Washington was more 70-30, and so when they did get into zone, Zach was able to identify it, Bushman was able to, uh, you know, find the void, and they were able to complete big chunk passes. I expect that as they see more zone coverage, I expect that trend to continue, or at least I hope it will. Shameless plug for the film room coming up on the Satake Show. I talked with Steve Clark about those three plays. And uh, he breaks it down. It's really the Terrific. over route. Yeah, yeah I love the classic BYU tight end route. Yeah, most definitely. Chad Lewis made his made his money on it. Uh, even going back to uh, what's Gordon? Who was Gordon Hudson? Hudson, thank you. And then my guy, the guys I played with, you know, Dennis Pitt and Andrew George, absolutely made a living on, on that play. And uh, it, it's a great play. And while I was glad to see it against Washington, I also want to see our our X and our Z, which are the wideouts. You know, your Talon Shumways, your Gunnar Romneys, your Dax Milnes. Um, become more involved on the outside, on the edge. Let's focus on the rushing attack for BYU. Certainly one of the storylines coming out of the Washington game was the loss of Tyson Williams, a, an absolute gut punch, first and foremost for him. Then obviously there's the effect uh, on the team moving forward. You've got Soup, Lopini Katoa. Those are the guys that are going to uh, be there to pick up the slack. What are your expectations for those guys as they do that? 
I think they're prepared. I think they're prepared, and they will take full advantage of their opportunity. I also think one of the things that works in, in their favor from a production standpoint is the fact that. Um, while we still are facing very good teams, just one of the things I learned here in a physics class at BYU is force equals mass times acceleration. And we're just not going to face the the size and speed on that on defensive fronts that we have through the first four weeks. We'll still play some very good team schemes and some very good players, but BYU's offensive line should have the size and athleticism advantage versus defensive fronts from here on out. So that bodes well for running backs who are running behind that offensive line. And I think those guys are capable. I think it became evident through the first four games that they maybe don't have quite the complete skill set that Tyson did, but I think they have enough to be productive to where I expect uh, at worst, the rush game to be neutral. And uh, like I said, giving that BYU uh, offensive line a chance to play against a little bit smaller guys, uh, they should be able to push them around and create bigger holes, which means that there could be a slight improvement to the rush game. We're talking with Riley Nelson, the radio analyst for BYU Radio on the football uh, broadcasts. And uh, you can catch Jason and Riley every uh, pregame, it feels like. Yeah, two Cougar pregame before, on right? two, Cougar two hours live. before. That's right. right. Hanging out. start this week. Looking forward to that. <laughs> uh, let's talk about there, – there are a lot of things that go into winning and losing, but the turnover numbers seem to be stark right now. When BYU hasn't had a giveaway, BYU's won, and when they have, they've had too many. They've had three each game. And then in both the losses, BYU's uh, allowed two non-defensive touchdowns in the Utah and Washington game. Um, is it as simple as don't turn it over for BYU's offense? I think so, but I, I – hesitate to endorse that thinking wholeheartedly because what it can do is take away risk. You still have to be aggressive, mm -hmm. you have to be assertive, and you have to take calculated risks, not dumb risks. Uh, the things... Look, Dax's fumble was unfortunate. Just the first drive of the second half, I think that's really took all the wind out of the sails, and it was, it was kind of over from there. And, and that was one where... When I talk about calculated risk, he tried to cut back against the safety. on a th He'd already converted a third and seven, and he was tiptoed against the sideline. That's one where it would be okay to go out of bounds. Your risk doesn't outweigh your reward. Your chances of actually cutting back and gaining substantial yardage after converting that third down are not very big, but your risk of something bad happening it was obviously very high as it did. And um, Likewise, the fumble that was returned, the sack fumble that was returned for a touchdown, yeah, there were some protection issues there, but bottom line, they were showing a pre-snap blitz look, and whenever you get that as a quarterback against a quality opponent like that, you gotta you got to shorten up your clock. And, and Zach who, by the way, he still hasn't completed a full season of starts yet, right? He's, uh, he's uh, 11 starts, I believe. Yeah, seven last yeah, four year. Plus yeah, seven. and four yeah. this year. So, uh, and a full season would be 12. So he still is a freshman by number when it comes to number of starts. Um, and, and that's something that hopefully he learned from in his season that, okay, if they're showing they're bringing the house, even if they bluff me, I still got to have that ball come out of my hand. So a couple of those things, it, when turnovers are mental mistakes and, and poor decisions, then yeah, they're really tough to swallow. But when they're effort things, like for example, the, the first the Francis Bernard pick six against Utah, that was an effort thing. Zach was trying to escape the pocket. The guy dove, barely got a shoestring, tri tripped him up, and the throw didn't get there, and Francis happened to be right place, right time. I don't have as much of a problem with that. It's more when the turnovers are, are, are a result of poor decision-making. And so that's something that I... I have seen clean up from week one. It did rear its ugly head again in week four, but I think they're on top of it. And I don't want them to get too focused on not turning the ball over. I want them to be more focused on making plays. BYU's rush defense numbers are near the bottom, and now they're facing a team in Toledo that I believe is 11th in the country in terms of rushing yards per game. How concerning are those numbers, especially against a team that going into, you know they're going to run the ball? They're going to run the ball. They're going to line up quickly and run quickly. They're also pretty much all run option. RPOs become a popular term and they do have RPOs built into their uh, built into their offense but they're also every single run play the quarterback who's not a huge run threat but he does keep it. I mean he's rushed for like 200 yards through four games. Yeah. 119 like against yeah, all right. State. Yeah, wild, yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. So he's a big enough threat there and that is a scheme that this BYU fence has not faced. So the tempo gave him, whenever Washington tempoed against this defense, they gave him some fits because they weren't lining up properly and then the reality is they faced much more traditional 
traditional quarterback takes it from under center, turns around, hands it off type schemes. This will be the first one of the spread option. Uh, so I, I, this is a significant challenge, and I'm, that's what I'm most excited to see going into this game is will that, will that BYU defense – answer that challenge. I did like late in the second half, not so much, about halfway through the third quarter, they came out and started running a four-man front and seemed to stiffen up against that Washington running attack that seemed to, you know, get six, seven yards at will in the first half. It did cause that four-man front caused some issues for it. So I'll be interested to see what they come out uh, schematically. Uh, they definitely are going to need to address the alignment issue when Toledo does hurry up into the next play because we're going to see, they're going to try and run a lot of plays. And then ultimately from a mental and a mindset standpoint are those guys out to prove something that they aren't the rush defense that we've seen through the four, first four weeks and establish a new identity going forward. Well, it's the second road game. It's a second trip to the Eastern time zone, and it went well the first time. Let's hope it goes uh, well the second time. Have fun at the Glass Bowl, and uh, we'll listen to you guys at uh, 10 a.m. Eastern time on BYU Radio. Yeah, get up. Don't watch uh, College day Game Day and those guys who are always wrong about BYU. <laughs> That's right. Listen, yeah, listen right, to the guys who really know. Right, we got you covered. <laughs> Thanks, Riley. Thanks, Riley. Thank you.